Welcome back to History of Mathematics. We are going to continue our work through Chapter 4 of the textbook, which is about Archimedes and the later Hellenistic period. And I wanted to talk today about the method of exhaustion. You'll remember from our last video on Archimedes' quadrature of the parabola that the method of exhaustion was very similar to integral calculus. So I'd like to take some time here to bridge what we know about calculus and what we can learn about Archimedes' method of exhaustion. Now, before we get to the connection between calculus and the method of exhaustion, I would like to take a second to talk about the difference between calculus and pre-calculus mathematics. It's not like the problem of finding the area under the graph always requires you to use calculus. For example, if we wanted to find the area shaded in green here in this picture, we actually don't need to use calculus. So if we want to find the area under the graph of this function, f of x equals 2 thirds x plus 1, bounded by the y-axis and the line x equals 3, we can just use what we know from elementary geometry. We can just cut that area up into a triangle and a circle, or a triangle and a square, and a rectangle, I guess, down there. So the area of that rectangle, it's uh, three units wide and one unit high, so that's area three, and the triangle on top is three units high, Three units wide and two units high, base is three, height is two, so one half base times height is there, and the area would be six. So we don't always need calculus to find areas. What we need calculus for is finding areas when the boundary curves aren't straight, they're actually bending, like this one here. So if we wanted to find the area of this graph, we would need to use calculus. Now, of course, Archimedes would have used all those triangles that we saw in the last video. But if we wanted to find this area, we would uh, do an integral. Okay, so what we would do is we would say, okay, we can't find that area using basic geometry, so we're going to approximate it using stuff that we do know. So we're going to take that interval on the x-axis from minus 2 to 2, and we're going to slice it up. And let's say, for example, we decide to use 10 slices. Then each slice would be 4 out of 10, right? The total length of this interval is 4 units. We're dividing it up into 10 pieces. So each interval would be 2 fifths of a unit long. And we would evaluate the function at some place in each of those subintervals. That would be the height of the rectangle. And we multiply by the width of the rectangle to get the total area for that one rectangle. Then we got to add them all up. Okay, so here I've decided to put in some of these rectangles here. Now, some of them are height zero. So they really are 10 rectangles, but a couple of them are height zero. So this is the lower bound here you can see i'm actually missing a lot of area there's a lot of stuff that isn't covered by my rectangles there so the more rectangles we use the better the approximation is you can see here if we use 50 rectangles we get this for our total area and you can see there's a lot less white in the picture but the way to get the exact area is we look at what happens when the number of rectangles increases without bound. In other words, we really have to take a limit. Whoop, too far. Okay. So this is the bridge to calculus. So this first expression here is using a finite number of rectangles. To get the exact area, we need to take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity if it exists. The 4 up here, of course, is coming from the fact that the interval I was working with was 4 units long. We're dividing that into n pieces. So each piece would be 4 over n. The f of x gives the height of the rectangle. 
xk is just some x value in the subinterval that we're dealing with. Okay, so the general steps are we begin with some unknown quantity. It can be an area, it can be a volume, it can be a length. It's something that we want to compute but can't using direct methods. So we slice whatever we're dealing with up into a bunch of pieces where we can find the area. And we approximate the total area by looking at the total value of all the slices. And then we want to see what happens when the number of pieces goes to infinity. So one of my favorite applications of this method of slicing is finding volumes of solids of revolution. So let's consider this right here. We've got the region bounded by the function y equals 4 minus 2x, the y-axis and the x-axis. So that's this triangle right here shaded in red in the picture. Now we're going to imagine revolving this region about the y-axis. So the vertical axis is going to stay fixed. And we imagine sweeping this region out around that y-axis. So it's going to make a three-dimensional figure. It's going to be a cone. The height of the cone is 4 units, and the base is 2. And we want to know the volume of the resulting shape. So here's how we can do it. We're going to use the method of slicing. We're going to imagine cutting the cone up into a bunch of pieces. And we're going to make each slice parallel to the base of the cone. Now the reason I'm choosing slices parallel to the base is because if I do that, my slices will be disks. Okay. They won't really be disks because the sides would be slanted, but it's going to be a close enough uh, approximation. So the more slices we make, the closer our pieces really will be to actual disks. So what we need to do is we need to find the volume of each disk and then add them up. Okay, well, volume of a disk... Well, we just take the area of the base, which is a circle, so pi r squared times the thickness. Delta y is the thickness of our slice. Now, the radius, that's a tricky little thing to do here. Okay, I'm slicing along the y-axis. So I want the radius to depend on the y variable, not the x variable. So that's why I'm going to have to do a little bit of work here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use similar triangles to help me figure this out. Okay, so this big triangle right here, the vertical side is 4 units, the horizontal side is 2. So the ratio of vertical to horizontal is 4 to 2. In the little triangle right here, the vertical side is 4 minus y, wherever y is there. And there's my radius, so it's 4 minus y over r should be equal to 4 over 2. And we can take that equation and solve it for r. And that's the radius as a function of r. And we can get the volume of an individual slice by doing this right here. Okay, what we do is we take pi times the radius squared times the thickness. And to approximate the total volume, we add those up. Add up the area of each of the disks. To get the exact volume, we do a limit. Now we know from our calculus that when you do a limit like this, that's going to turn into an integral. So we can find this volume by doing an integral. Uh, this isn't too hard because... This expression in here is just a polynomial. So what I did is I expanded out this thing. I multiplied it out. I integrated it. I'm evaluating at 4 and 0. And I get 16 pi over 3 for the volume of my cone. All right. And uh, I would note that if you do remember the formula for the volume of a cone from solid geometry, this will agree. But the, the thing I wanted to remind you of was the application of this method of slicing to finding a volume 
of a solid of revolution. And I also want to emphasize that Archimedes basically had this slicing technique down pat back in the Hellenistic Greek period. So we've got his work to build on.